Good afternoon. I'm Jenny Lawson. I'm the Chief Civic Innovation Officer at Points of Light. Welcome to the next edition of Listen, Learn, Act to End Racism. One year ago this month, Points of Light and Morehouse College embarked on a Listen, Learn, Act to End Racism initiative and partnership for individuals, businesses, and nonprofits that care about creating a more just and equitable society and want to take informed action within their communities, social networks, and places of employment to support an end to racism. These monthly conversations uh, are designed for each of us to learn more about racial equity movements, organizations, leaders, and everyday people who have experienced and are fighting systemic racism and social injustice. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. We are so glad to have you with us and uh, really encourage you to consider this conversation a starting point. It's meant to spark interest and invites you to join us at on the website, and the team will put the link for that website into the chat to learn more and to find out ways to take action around the issues you're learning about today. For those of you who are returning, welcome back. We're glad to have you with us once again. Today's conversation is the first of a two-part series that will continue with our December webinar focused on solutions for economic and racial equity uh, in our December webinar. So today I am pleased to introduce our partner and friend, Dr. Clarissa Myrick Harris, who is chair of the Division of Humanities and professor of Africana Studies at Morehouse College, who will be moderating and participating in today's conversation. Clarissa, I know you're there somewhere, welcome. And uh, we are so grateful once again to have you join us. Hello, Jennifer. Thank you for that introduction and welcome to everyone in our audience this afternoon. Welcome to this conversation, which is really part one of our conversation about black economic empowerment and today's uh, session, Making a Way the quest for Black uh, economic empowerment, rather. Um, and, and in this conversation, we're gonna provide a historical perspective. Uh, as Jennifer has noted, today's events uh, mark uh, the one year anniversary of Morehouse College's partnership with Points of Light for the Listen, Learn, Act to End Racism initiative. Uh, and we believe, based on the responses we've gotten from attendees over the past 12 months, that we've been able to provide useful information about the historical context and current realities of systemic racism, as well as ways to combat inequities, injustices, wherever you find it, but especially here in the United States. I know our audience is uh, across the United States and even uh, across the globe. Uh, our stakeholders at Morehouse who have participated and will participate in future conversations look forward to continuing to raise awareness and perhaps down the line partnering with some of the organizations, institutions, individuals, and corporate sponsors to act in targeted ways to end systemic racism. Today we're delving into the African-American quest for economic empowerment that began really with the earliest Black presence in America. First, let me define what we mean by economic empowerment. Uh, a simple definition is the, comp the capacity of women and men to participate in, contribute to, and benefit from growth processes in ways that recognize the value of their contributions, respect their dignity, and make it possible to negotiate a fairer distribution of, of wealth. In terms of Black economic empowerment, specifically we're talking about policies and practices, actions that aim to give Black people the chance to earn more than a minimum wage, own more property, successful businesses that create financial resources for, uh, for themselves, their families, communities, as well as positively impact the national and even global economies. It means creating the context, environment, and opportunities for the creation of generational wealth. 
the McKinsey Institute for Black Economic Mobility talks about the quest for Black economic empowerment as work anchored on five economic roles that individuals play in the economy. I'm gonna run through these very quickly. First, as workers, racial gaps exist across the US labor market, especially in occupational representation, ultimately manifesting as a $220 billion annual wage disparity between white and black workers. Business owners across all sectors, black owned businesses are few in number and small in size due to lower rates of realized entrepreneurship and lack of access to capital. Consumers, consumption by black Americans remain below its potential due to lower in incomes, poor access and unsatisfied demand. In black communities, collectively, there is, I'm told, uh, a $1.2 trillion in potential buying power that largely remains untapped. Savers, investors, the racial wealth gap is the result of low intergenerational transfers of wealth, lower incomes, and lack of financial inclusion. The median Black household has just one eighth the wealth of the median white median white household with inheritances driving 60% of the disparities in annual flows. Residents, many fundamental services delivered by the public sector fall short for Black Americans, limiting their economic participation. Some public programs have eligibility and implementation rules that create barriers to participation or disparities in spending. Others are underfunded relative to the scale of need. During enslavement, and we're going all the way back to provide this historical context today, during enslavement, slavery industrialized black bodies. It was a source of wealth and labor in a way that created wealth for multiple generations of European Americans and their families. Slave owners turned their portfolios of human capital into venture capital that ultimately funded industries and birthed lucrative businesses, establishing an economic model that continues across markets today. Beyond serving as tangible assets themselves, enslaved laborers further generated the cash flow needed to build expansive enterprises and acquire additional assets. During slavery, there were enslaved entrepreneurs of sorts. Um, they were enslaved and had to um, to use their labor uh, in making products or, pro or, or raising produce. Um, often they were hired out by their enslavers, but in some cases they were able to negotiate to keep some of the products of their labor uh, and to, in some cases, accumulate wealth as blacksmiths, as carpenters, as seamstresses, as laundresses. And they were able to accumulate uh, a portion of what they earned and in some cases, even finally buy their freedom or the freedom of their family members, their spouses and, and others. Uh, these independent, and there were independent Black entrepreneurs among free African Americans throughout the South and of course in the North. And these entrepreneurs provided goods and services for both Black and white communities. Next week, we'll talk about labor unions and African-American participation in labor movements. But because we wanna to get to this historical context, I'm going to move forward in our conversation. And I want to just note that the themes um, that we are going to be talking about uh, include uh, the, the state of black workers uh, historically, and when we provide this historical context, there'll be a better understanding of why we're facing the challenges we're facing, the, the inequities, the social injustices today. Um, and so before we jump into this um, current initiative um, discussion again, um, we are going to have this wonderful conversation today with our two panelists, so the two individuals who are joining me in this conversation. So I'm gonna introduce them to you now, and then we'll get started. Dr. Keith Hollingsworth. Keith, and you can uh, join us visually and um, audio. 
Keith Hollingsworth is a professor of business administration at Morehouse College, where he has served since 1994. He also served as chair of the business administration department from 2007 to 2018, and is currently the interim department chair. His paper in Accounting Historian's Journal recovered the identity of one of the South's first black CPAs and Morehouse College's first alumnus with a CPA. In October 2021, he spoke at the Keller Center at Princeton University on working twice as hard to get half as much, earning legitimacy as a Black business in history. Our other participant panelists in this conversation is attorney Hannibal B. Johnson. Attorney Johnson is a graduate of Harvard Law School. He did his undergraduate work at the University of Arkansas, where he completed a double major in economics and sociology. Johnson is an attorney, author, and independent consultant specializing in diversity and inclusion, cultural competence issues, and nonprofit governance. Johnson has also served as an adjunct professor at the University of Tulsa College of Law, and he serves on the Federal 400 Years of African American History Commission, a body charged with planning, developing, and implementing activities appropriate for the 400th anniversary of the 1619 arrival of Africans in the English colonies in Virginia. He chairs the Education Committee for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacres Centennial Commission, and Attorney Johnson is past president of Leadership Tulsa, the Metropolitan Tulsa Urban League, and the Northeast Oklahoma Black Lawyers Association. He's authored several books about the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma, known as Black Wall Street, including, um, I think his latest book, Black Wall Street 100, and American City grapples with its historical racial trauma. And so gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today for this conversation. And so I, I want to, to start um, uh, to talk about, to provide this, this historical context for what's going on today. Um, just noting that for much of the nation's history, biased and legally enforced barriers block Black Americans' avenues to participating in the white-dominated mainstream economy, forcing African Americans to find our own paths toward economic empowerment. Um, Attorney Johnson, we'll start with you. Unpacking this concept of economic empowerment, how does your interpretation of this term unpack the, the barriers faced by Black Americans? When I think about economic empowerment, I think of two dimensions, really, the psychological dimension and the physical dimension. In terms of psychology, I'm thinking about our own um, understanding and embrace of our capacity and competence in the economic sphere. And that has been severely damaged and challenged by white supremacy for decades and for centuries. In fact, one of the reasons that history is so important, the history like the history of Tulsa, is that we have incredible examples of economic and entrepreneurial success in the face of a white supremacist philosophy and in the face of de jure or by law segregation. So that's the psychological dynamic. And then the physical dimension or dynamic that's associated with economic empowerment for, for Black folks really is about two things, I think, Ac assets and access. And when I, talk about ac when I talk about assets, I'm really talking fundamentally about land and financial capital with which to create businesses. And when I talk about access, I'm really talking about the ability to participate in the, the larger economy. So even in Tulsa, while there was a success successful black economic community and entrepreneurial community, it was less successful than it could have been had black folks been able to engage with the white dominated larger economy in which they existed, right? So these folks were, were paying taxes to the, in the city of Tulsa, but they were not getting their fair share of things like infrastructure, roads, sewers, et cetera. 
So while there was some success by creating an insular black economy in which dollars circulated and, and recirculated, that success was constrained still by the segregation which, which existed in the larger society. Yes, indeed. Um, and um, Dr. Harlinsworth, can you um, just add to that, this discussion? Well, I think on both sides of that, and I, I really love the framework Attorney Johnson's brought forward. I mean, you think about assets and access. I, I, when I teach my students on Black entrepreneurship, we talk about, can you just imagine what it was like for freed slaves? Uh, suddenly an army comes through and goes, you're free. Mm -hmm. There's no preparation. You're not used to really controlling your own life. You're not used to making decisions for yourself. I mean, honestly, you've been told what to do from dawn to dusk for the most of the part. You've, you've, most people were not taught to read and write. It was illegal. It's hard to imagine how low black people were starting which makes us just that much prouder of what's been accomplished, right? And they had to come together and take care of each other. And you have such a strong communal sense through the churches and other social organizations. And then you think about the psychological aspects. As late as 1909, President William Howard Taft spoke at a black college, at a black college in Charlotte, and told them, your race is adopted to be a race of farmers first and for all time. I, I mean, just we can't imagine just saying that to a group of black people, you the president, and I'm wondering the people who invited him, but why did we do this? He defended not appointing black people to political positions by comparing it to disability, being black to a disability. He said, it's a question of fitness. We wouldn't put a black person in a position they couldn't handle, just like we wouldn't put a one-legged man uh, to be a mail carrier. They're just mm -hmm. unable to do the job. And so you think about that's from the white supremacy side, but often, unfortunately, it, it fell even in the black community. Charles Spalding, who was a great business leader, started North Carolina Mutual, said in 1932, with or without reason, the colored man begins with the presumption of guilt hovering over him. Without proof, his customers will believe him guilty of unsanitation, of discourtesy, of unprogressiveness, of depleted stock, of inferior goods, of slightly higher prices than his white competitor. The burden from the outset is upon him to prove his innocence. And I think if you try to define white privilege today, it's that we don't have that burden. And he even tells the story of a black woman who wouldn't patronize a black store because she said that the white store sugar was sweeter. And, so, and, all, and this, today. Yeah. all this is so ironic when you consider that African-Americans were the major labor force in this country, especially in the South. And they provided um, not only labor in the fields, but also their, um, they were artisans. Um, they were uh, people who, who, who actually provided the food, who, um, who, who, who really provided products across the board in terms of the economy uh, when they were enslaved. And then also in terms of free blacks, they owned businesses, they did business with white consumers during enslavement. Um, and also we even have the examples during the Civil War of the Port Royal experiment. It was an experiment to see if African-Americans could become independent uh, and have um, uh, economic viability. Uh, and they were successful in that. And you had St. Catherine's Island. Um, Tunis Campbell actually created this self-contained um, community and they were able to raise good, raise produce and produce uh, products needed by the Union forces during the Civil War. They were very successful. And the only reason that economy did not continue was because the white slave owners who had run away from the Union soldiers, they came back and reclaimed their land. So you have this history of African-Americans being uh, exceptional in terms of entrepreneurship. Right, and, and in that, fact, one of the things yeah. I'm telling my students is that there were certain occupations that were considered black occupations. Exactly. You yes. wouldn't really have found a white barber in the 1800s. Yes. I mean, barbering was considered a black uh, trade. Actually, cooking and restaurateurs, for the most part, were considered a yes. black trade. Most white people weren't considered to know how to cook. 
that would have been a practically a black trade. So there were trades that were really considered black trades up until pretty much the late of the 1800s. So the idea that you can't do business when you've actually restricted them to certain areas of business and expect them to do that. Yes. But that just reinforces, but that yeah. reinforces a really, uh, I think a really critical element of the, of the discussion. And, and that is that economic viability is dependent on political power yes. ultimately. And so you can prove yourself, as Booker T. Washington would say, to be industrious and to be able to self-govern and all that. But that means very little if you have no political power. Right. Exactly. And, and he thought if you were economically successful, you would be granted political power. And there's a lot of respect about what he believed. But he was wrong in that one. <laughs> We've had a lot of evidence that even very successful black people did not uh, achieve respect from the white community. If anything, they painted a target on their back. Exactly. And actually put themselves in more danger by being successful. Uh, an example I gave in my paper that where it's still today, uh, Michael Harriet, who just stepped down from writing for uh, The Root, put out a tweet in 2019 that he had looked at one full year of people who appeared on Meet the Press. And there were politicians, speakers, and everything. Some people didn't have college degrees. Some people never even get into college. But every Black person during that entire year had at least a master's or a PhD except for one person. So that that is where sort of the name of the paper came from, yeah, which I hear my students say all the time. You got to work twice as hard to get half as far. Yes, yes. Well, it's, it's, the, it's really the idea of the, the exceptional Negro. And, and, and I, I would, I'll, I'll put this out there. Um, it's, it's subject to controversy, perhaps. But I would argue that um, part of the reason that Barack Obama was, was elected president is that he is in every way an exceptional Negro, pardon the language, but that's, that's the old school language. So if he had had the credentials that say, oh, uh, President Trump had, and he were black, uh, do you think he would have been elected president of the United States? No. Interesting, very, very interesting. Uh, but, but let's get back to this historical context. Okay, um, we know that uh, African-Americans were the labor force of the South during enslavement. Uh, and some, as, as we said earlier, managed to um, earn um, income from that. Even while enslaved, free blacks had businesses, were successful entrepreneurs throughout the South and in the North. Um, and they proved themselves time and time again. After the war, Reconstruction, you have African-Americans coming together to establish community. Uh, they wanted to reunite their families. That was a priority, establishing churches. And within those churches, they established businesses, social institutions. The black church really became the basis for establishing black economic viability um, even before reconstruction, but certainly after. And so what occurred uh, very soon after, and it's amazing how quickly and what short period of time that African-American literacy uh, increased after being legally prevented from learning to read and write throughout the South during enslavement, literacy shot up. Uh, African-American ownership of businesses increased dramatically. Uh, and of course, we know thousands upon thousands of African-Americans were entrapped in the convict lease system, entrapped in sharecropping. So that goes uh, without saying, we know that that existed. But also what existed were African-Americans through their own agency, um, wherewithal, uh, were able to establish uh, not only strong communities, but those strong communities were supported by strong economic um, enterprises. And examples of those, um, uh, Attorney Johnson, Black Wall Street in, um, in Atlanta, we actually had a viable Black businesses integrated actually throughout the downtown area. Um, and of course, that came to a halt in Atlanta during the 1906 Atlanta massacre, uh, when those black businesses downtown were destroyed by, uh, by whites um, who felt threatened by those black businesses and were, um, were afraid of uh, Negro, what they call Negro rule. And of course, the uh, supposed impetus for that was uh, assaults uh, by black men on white women. Uh, that was proven false. And what was actually the case was it was an assault. It was an attempt to, to end 
uh, what was uh, perceived as black progress and what was black progress. In Atlanta, African-Americans were able to uh, come together and move to the east side and establish Sweet Auburn Avenue, which actually became by the mid 20th century, what was called by Fortune Magazine, the richest Negro street in the world, okay? Um, but that situation in terms of an assault that, that resulted in African-Americans closing ranks and, and creating their own um, extremely viable community was not replicated across the country. We know these assaults occurred, um, scores of them. And if, what happened in Tulsa, uh, Attorney Johnson? Tell us a few more details about that. People are generally, I, I think, familiar, at least at a superficial level, with the 1921 Tulsa race massacre, which is arguably the worst of the acts of domestic terrorism uh, based on race. In, in these United States. Tulsa was a very successful uh, black business community, a segregated neighborhood, literally across the Frisco tracks from downtown Tulsa. This was more of a black Main Street than a black Wall Street. And then it wasn't a, a, an investment capital or banking capital. It was mom and pop type operations, small businesses, hotels, grocery stores, restaurants, theaters, mo movie parlors, dance halls, a conglomeration of professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, and dentists. Very successful because the dollars stayed within the confines of this community, in part because of de jure or by law segregation. And even the Black folks who worked outside that community brought their dollars ultimately back into the community and had lunch or went to a movie or got their hair done, whatever. And so that was really the financial foundation of the community. But the community in part because of its success became threatening to some of the white uh, community in, in Tulsa. I talk about the psychological phenomenon called cognitive dissonance, which is um, a misalignment between what you believe ought to be true and what is actually true on the ground. So if you have a white supremacist mindset, you believe that um, white folks should be on top in, in every uh, level of analysis, including the economics, so if you can look across the Frisco tracks to the north and you're a white person, you see black folks driving cars, owning homes, owning businesses, it causes this, this psychic tension, this cognitive dissonance. So what can you do to really harmonize what you believe to be true with what is, what is actually true? Well, cer certainly one of the options is you can resort to violence to destabilize and bring down the black community a few pegs. So that's part of the, the dynamics psychologically that led to the massacre in Tulsa in 1921. But the, the overarching narrative here in Tulsa is that the indomitable human spirit prevailed. The story is really about these remarkable black people who had vision, who had determination, perseverance, resilience, all those universally acclaimed qualities that led them to build this great community and rebuild it when necessary and sustain it for decades upon decades. And I'm sitting right in the heart of that community today in my office. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and Keith, uh, your research um, focuses on the golden age of black businesses and uh, both Sweet Auburn and Tulsa fall within um, that, that time frame, And we, we know that um, Sweet Auburn's in the South, in Atlanta, Tulsa's in the West as, re as a result of that great, that migration, that westward migration, the exodusters and, and so on. And then the great migration North um, with some stops along the way in urban Southern uh, centers um, was a part of this movement uh, that created um, these black businesses across the country. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yes, because uh, the other part of that movement is rural to urban. And I think that's part of what's so important here. Around 1900, 90% of black people in the South lived in rural areas. Now think about that. You're just really scattered all the way across on farms and so forth. So while you could create mom and pop businesses, it is very hard to create a business of any size because of segregation and Jim Crow and everything else. You just literally don't have the market large enough to do this. So the reason Dr. Juliet Walker calls 1900, 1930, the golden age of black businesses is that's when you started getting the large black businesses in communities. So you start getting North Carolina Mutual and Durham. You start getting Atlanta Life and Standard Life in Atlanta. You start getting Bronzeville in Chicago. Uh, you start getting Tulsa in the Greenwood District. 
But what happened was suddenly people are moving into cities. And even though those uh, locations weren't the best because, again, red line, it wasn't redlining at the time, but still restrictions. You have thousands of people living in a very small area, but you finally have a large enough market that you can start really supporting. So Jim Crow, in a way, and the migration, in a way, helped create these these great, vibrant business communities because now you had a large enough market to do it. And I think it contributed something else. I think you start getting more political power. And I think you're starting to change that psychological uh, mindset that Eternal Johnson was talking about. Because that is when you get the Harlem Renaissance. That is when you get Marcus Garvey. Because now you're surrounded suddenly by other black people that you can see role models. You can see successful business people. You can see people who have, uh, you know, are able to have a uh, disposable income out through factory jobs in the North, Detroit, in Chicago. And you're starting to build this up. And that has to have a huge psychological activity. I've, I've heard about Atlanta. One of the most powerful things I heard was that, you know, the civil rights leaders we think of like Martin Luther King and Maynard Jackson were able to grow up in a place where they were shielded from some of Jim Crow, a lot of Jim Crow because they wouldn't ride the trolleys. They didn't have to. They wouldn't go to theaters. They had their own. So there was a sense they were spared from some of the daily indignities and were able to not have that, yeah. quite that burden on them. So and I think I that movement that. from rural to <laughs> urban yes. really made a big difference in creating these businesses because it provided this examples all around you and a large enough market to actually be successful. So you're moving from mom and pops to yeah. now significant size businesses. Yeah. So we have this confluence of, uh, of social, uh, political, uh, and economic factors uh, in terms of the Great Migration. And that Great Migration was encouraged by industries in the North because there was a shortage of European yes. uh, workers. And so they said, oh, okay, we have all these Black folks in the South, let's tell them to come North. And, and so, them. yes paid their way to come up north. And I think it's why you see people go into certain areas, like Mississippi went to Chicago, Georgia went to New Jersey, because you'd be calling your cousins. I got a job for you, come on up. You can stay with me for a while. And, mm -hmm. and so you built this sort of rivers, almost yes. rivers of people yeah. moving north and west. Exactly. But, but what you're talking about though, automatically sets up conflict between those new, new black migrants and yes. white folks who feel that they're entitled to whatever jobs exist. Exactly, yes. exactly. Um, uh, Keith, there was a, a question. One of our um, attendees asked you to repeat that quote that you gave from President Taft. Um, repeat that, and then there's, a, another, I think, um, more we can say that speaks to that as well. Could you repeat that, please? President William Hamburg Taft said, your race is adopted to be a race of farmers first and all the time. And this was reported in the Charlotte Evening Chronicle in 1909. I think he was at Johnson C. Smith when he said this. Isn't that something? And so uh, really, beginning in the 1900s, you, you have a, a situation, a reality that countered that in terms of the Great Migration, the call for African-Americans um, to go north, um, and then the successes among African-Americans within the context of these new urban environments. And so, um, but that speaks to uh, the mentality, the persistent mentality within um, the highest uh, levels of leadership in the country. Um, but then we, we have to, gentlemen, we have to speak a, a little bit about um, Booker T. Washington um, and in terms of um, his, um, his agency um, and his role in supporting Black businesses in terms of his national organization, but also in terms of his complicity in perpetuating um, the idea that African Americans uh, would not aspire to the same level of political empowerment and social standing of, of white, uh, white people, of Europeans. Uh, what was it, his quote, we can remain as separate as the five fingers on the hand and all things social, um, and he meant political too, um, but work as one in terms of the economic uh, empowerment of the, I'm paraphrasing, in terms of the economic um, viability of the country. And he, in that Cotton State Exposition speech that he gave in 1895, 
in Atlanta, Georgia, in Piedmont Park, noted very specifically, hey, you have Black people here. You don't need those immigrants from Europe. We're right here. We're willing to work. Uh, and we'll work in the farms. We'll work, um, you know, in, the, in those areas um, that uh, do not require um, a great education, um, even though he, of course, became the principal of Tuskegee uh, Institute at that point. Uh, and, um, and, and he was an interesting fellow because he supported civil rights, um, clandestinely, civil rights leaders uh, and campaigns. But his, um, his persona, the image he projected was one who uh, espoused that African-Americans um, should lift themselves up by their bootstraps, be the labor force and not aspire to those things that uh, most Americans, white Americans would. Can you speak to that a bit, that the contradictions? For, for me, um, I focus less on the contradiction mm -hmm. uh, and more on the commonality between, uh, say, a Booker T. Washington and a W.E.B. Du Bois, because I think mm -hmm. both, both of them had ultimately the welfare of Black folks um, in, in the forefront of their minds. And I see Booker T. as somebody who, who basically advocated something that I could sum up in, 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 a, in a quote from Arthur Ashe. Arthur Ashe, in, in talking about a subject, once said, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. And I, and I, I see Booker T. as really advocating, let's, let's develop ourselves as best we can with what we have available to us now. Let's focus on this economic stuff, and the political stuff can wait. And, and I see Du Bois as saying, no, these things are inextricably intertwined. The political stuff can't wait. We have to move on that front. Um, in that, at, a, at a minimum, we have to move on that front simultaneously with the economic work that we're doing. So I don't necessarily see as much of a, a, a contradiction because it, it does seem to me that both of them had the welfare of Black folks front and center. And they were... Um, they were putting forth approaches or, or paradigms that they thought might advance the race. Yes. You know, and my students pointed out to me, and it, this and this really helped me, Booker T. Washington and Du Bois both reflected where they came from. Booker T. Washington was born a slave. He grew up extremely poor. He walked yes. all the way to Hampton. He showed up looking so bad they weren't gonna let him in. He had to sort of work as a janitor first before they would let him in. So it's natural he would think if you just work hard enough, you can lift yourself up because I have. Du Bois, on the other hand, grew up in a more, he grew up, at, he was born after slavery. He probably grew up in a more upper middle class background, went to Harvard. I mean, there, he just, there was a different, so my students said they both actually reflected their own background about mm -hmm. what they thought they had achieved. I have to say this though, because I'm a big, and I encourage anybody to read the transcript from the 1899 conference, The Negro in Business, that was held in Atlanta. Du Bois said it. Because first of all, Du Bois is the one who called for National Negro Business League. And then the next year, Booker T. Washington started, but didn't give him any credit for it. <laughs> but Du Bois actually called for it. And so they both believed in this. They both believed in using the community so black businesses should support each other. And it's very important, I think, to read John Hope's uh, essay in there on the meaning of business. Because John Hope brings out that as we talk about these people moving from rural to urban, it wasn't just black people, it was white people too. That's they were true. moving from the Appalachian down in. This is part of what created the tension of the 1906 race riot. It was poor white people coming in and now our yes. economic competition. And they're the ones who were tearing the town apart. The elites just uh, winked and winked at it and let it go. But the poor people, but John Hope said, if the white man has a choice, he's going to hire another white man. We have to take care of ourselves because mm -hmm. these poor white people are starting to take positions that used to be considered exclusively black. Yes, yes. But Keith, I'm, I must note that uh, it has been documented that in those throngs of 10,000 um, rioters, white rioters in 1906 in Atlanta, there were among them um, policemen, there were among oh, yeah. them some of the wealthy um, citizens of uh, the city. Um, so they joined forces across class lines to, yeah. to wage that attack on the- oh, At least you know which is more uh, tight, the uh, 
ratio of the class. So apparently class, that you could eliminate class lines before you eliminate ratio it, lines. Yeah, <laughs> this is true, this is true. And then let's bring another individual in the mix here in this discussion in terms of Marcus Darby. Uh, you can't really talk about black uh, economic empowerment in the United States without talking about his role in that, in the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Um, and so what would, were his uh, contributions in terms of black economic empowerment? What were some of the, the uh, tensions he faced? Not only um, pushback or assaults from the black, white community, but also in some cases from the black community. Yeah, so Garvey, I mean, is he's most associated with this notion of, of, of back to Africa. If we can't, if we can't get our just desserts here, then maybe maybe we remove ourselves to, to the motherland, make a fresh start without all these artificial barriers. Race, of course, is a social construct anyway. There's nothing really real about it in a biological sense. And so 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 why not try another place and space? Um, as 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 one alternative to the dilemma that we face here in the United States. True, but he started. He you know, he had a network of of businesses um, uh, in this country and, and also elsewhere in the world as well. Uh, and he and he really touted that um, that mounts. And interestingly enough, he um, was a fan of Booker T. Washington uh, and uh, his help self-help philosophy, but uh, he went in a slightly different direction in terms of what he was um, promoting, uh, his ideas among African-Americans, but um, it, essentially African-Americans doing for themselves, establishing their own businesses. Um, he was an extremely powerful leader uh, with a great deal of economic clout in the United States uh, as it, a part of that preparation for the the back to Africa as aspect, you know, so he established that network and uh, um, and wealth to a great extent here in the States. And then of course, um, a number of things, attacks again, not only from whites, but also from other civil rights leaders like Booker, like um, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, and, and others um, really uh, led to his downfall. And of course um, he was convicted of um, of various crimes, um, some would argue made up, um, and uh, his power and his leadership was then um, it dissolved. Um, so, in, in this context, you know, we have these uh, different individuals um, who were uh, all talking about African American economic empowerment. We had a degree of empowerment and wealth in various black communities across the country actually. Um, and then we had these assaults and then we had um, efforts to curtail uh, black empowerment. Um, politically, there were efforts, there were laws enacted, uh, Wagner um, law in terms of the labor force. Um, you had laws enacted to prevent African-Americans from ownership um, of, of land, of, of property. Um, and so what were some of the responses of African Americans during this time to these assaults on all sides. Can we talk about that a little bit? We know there were well, boycotts, strikes. That, again, you talk about just uh, the African American communities always had to be a community and take care of each other. I don't know if you're thought about the middleman theory, but it's this notion that you know when the outside forces are hostile, the internal cohesion becomes even stronger. Mm -hmm. So there are ways that overcame this. I mean, you think about 1941, A. Philip Randolph uh, went to Roosevelt and threatened a march on Washington that unless the federal defense contractors were integrated, like you got all of these black workers and yet all the contractors to the federal defenses, because at that time, even though we were not in the war, we were providing all the equipment for Britain. So the country was mobilized in a wartime production uh, but they were segregated and Randolph went and said, we need to, uh, you know, you need to integrate or we're going to march on Washington. And so if Roosevelt, of course, said this isn't the right time, you know, we might be about to go to war. So as I tell my students, you will never be told it's the right time to protest, <laughs> nor will you be told it's the right way to protest. So, uh, you know, so he was told it was the wrong time and, and Randolph said, I don't care. <laughs> so three. <laughs> 
Three days before the uh, march was to take place, Roosevelt uh, caved, he blinked and created Executive Order 8802, I think, maybe 8806. Yeah. Um, that integrated the, um, you know, the federal defense contractors. Was it perfect? No, but it was the first step that later would lead to the integration of the military in 1948, and later civil rights laws and everything would be based upon that initial executive order that had happened. So I'm always trying to tell my students that we think of the civil rights era as 1955, but there were a lot of steps that led up to that. John Hervey Wheeler in Durham, North Carolina was trying to make the case to white business loan owners that you're hurting yourself economically by segregation. And yes. he brought reams, he's one of the first data analytics guys. He was bringing forth reams of data saying, look how much of market you're leaving out because you segregate. Mm -hmm. And so there was all these kind of efforts to sort, yes. of, sort of pull this in and, and make this case. I mean, the FHA set up uh, home loans, but then listed every black neighborhood as risky mm -hmm. and inherently said any mixed race neighborhood was risky. So then the moment a black person moved into a neighborhood, prices fell yes. because the FHA had put it in their laws mm -hmm. that it was inherently risky if you had a black person living there. Yes. Uh, and, and Keith, you, you, you bring up a, a very important person in this discussion in terms of black economic empowerment, A. Philip Randolph, uh, who we know was the founder of the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters in 1925. Um, but even before um, he established, and that's viewed as the first um, really powerful Black union, but even before that, as early as 1835, there was a, a, a union of Black workers, Calkers Union, um, in, 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 in Washington, the Washington, D.C. early area. Um, but also in 1913, uh, an organization called the National Alliance of Postal and Federal Employees was established, 1913, by a group of Black men uh, who met in Tennessee. And these were men who had been working on the railroads uh, as mail, um, mail, you know, they had mail clerks in the railroad cars um, guarding the, the mail. Uh, and as long as those cars were made of wood, uh, it was a, a black profession, primarily black men um, were hired for those jobs. But the moment they turned those cars, uh, built them from steel, um, the movement to, to displace those black workers um, and to um, open up the field for white workers began. And so these black men came together to protest be losing their jobs. Um, because they were were black and uh, losing those jobs to white workers. So you have people who were in the labor movement who were pivotal to the civil rights movement, like A. Philip Randolph, like E.D. Nixon in Montgomery, Alabama, who really ignited that bus boycott and pulled King into that um, that movement. Um, I think we all, we also have, I think we have to also acknowledge though that. Um, the response to black labor organizing has not always been positive. Oh no! Uh, certainly, certainly not from the perspective of, of many of the unions. And so, one example that comes to mind for me is the Elaine Arkansas massacre in 1919, which resulted in yes. part from black folks trying to organize the Progressive Farmers and Household Union of America yes. to, to get sort of better prices for the for the cotton crop and better conditions for, for the sharecroppers that, that lived in that area in Phillips County, and they were slaughtered for this. Yes, yes, um, what, what 200 men were killed in, in, in that in, in assault. Um, and that does speak to, um, uh, uh, I thought we were frozen for a moment, uh, I think we're good now. Uh, that does speak to the, the response, the white response to Black organizing for economic empowerment. Um, and uh, there uh, also is that history of African Americans who were excluded from white labor organizations, then being brought in uh, as quote unquote strike breakers. Uh, they were hired in those jobs that they had been banned from previously when white workers uh, went on strike that created another layer of tension between African-American and white workers. Can you talk a bit about that, the, the impact of that um, during that time? 
isn't it interesting though that that um, this notion of race being being a being a unifier of different economic strata who are who, who are of the same race, right? So mm -hmm. the the owners of those enterprises that were hiring those strike breakers were they sympathetic to the black people who, who were brutalized by the white people who felt that they had been cheated out of, out of their jobs? So we have to think about how race has been used as a political yes. through line to achieve um, ends or goals that are not necessarily ours. Yes, yes, ex exactly. You know, but Car Carissa, as we said the other day, so one of the frustrating things about teaching black entrepreneur history that I do is you see the same arguments repeated from 200 years ago. Every time black people get any sense of power, you come all the way and there's trouble. Uh, you just said about President Obama being the exceptional Negro, but still he got elected and there is pushback against it. And you see the, 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 the reaction to it. And so you see that constantly. But one of the things we try to emphasize in this class is not just to put on the negative, go back to what attorney Johnson said earlier about the indomitable spirit. I'm always talking to my students about a way out of no way. What these people, what the, I, I tell them at the end of the class, on the last day of class, I hope you can see from my teaching how much I respect and appreciate this. How much I respect and appreciate these people who even as slaves would find a way to make enough money to try to buy freedom or at least have some sort of autonomy. You yes, look at these mom and pop businesses who did anything possible to have some sort of freedom over themselves you can't help but be inspired if you really read what they accomplish. And I want my students to say, if you think you've got a hard time now, let me show you <laughs> what has happened. And I say that, I mean, I look at J.B. Blayton, first black CPA in the South. He took the test 13 times before he passed. Mm. So don't fuss it. I mean, you know, so there's take inspiration from this. Yes, yes, indeed. Gentlemen, uh, I, I think it's time for us to uh, answer some questions if there are some among our, our audience, but also think about um, as we begin to answer uh, two or three of the questions, uh, I want you each also to come back and speak about um, ways or, or some of the actions that people in our audience can take um, having heard this history, what role can our uh, nonprofit organizations, corporate business leaders play in moving the narrative forward and continuing to support Black economic empowerment? Knowing this history, knowing what the barriers have been and still are. So think about that, but uh, I want to see if we have any questions. One question. Uh, the agencies of African, let me, let's see, the agencies of African descendants have always been uh, inherent and evident. The evolutionary practices of oppression, extraction, and exploitation have continuously inhibited, obstructed, and obscured the progress of Black people around the world, really. What can be done to remedy this today? Ooh, that's a deep one. Uh, does anyone want to tackle that? <laughs> I don't know if we can do anything today, <laughs> but, but uh, that, that, I mean, that's a huge uh, question of historical sweep. So I think um, like most complicated things, it has to be approached in a multifaceted way. Yes. What we're doing today, talking about the economic underpinnings of where we are, is, is, is a part of that puzzle. It's not the be all and end all, but, it, but it's a part of what has to be done. We have to deconstruct what is to yes. understand it better. Exactly, exactly. Keith? Well, I want to, same guy who asked the question, just put a, a comment in the chat. And I think it is important to try to get out of this desensitiz desensitization. And part of that is to show that this occurred. Uh, a lot of the stuff we've talked about today, most people don't hear. Right. And it's sad that this is even now being stripped out of classrooms because we don't want to make people feel bad. There's, and, and I understand maybe you don't want to do it to five-year-olds, but there comes a point when you should be able to talk about that there are issues here. And yes. certainly if it gets stripped out of college curriculums, that's just a shame. But I think, you know, the there's a movie that just came out about Black Cowboys, The Harder They Fall. I haven't seen it yet. 
But I think you need those kind of things that show. I mean, I'm surprised that the Watchman show is the one that actually brought the Tulsa massacre yes. to a lot of people's attention. But I've worked at a black college for years. So I'm like, really? You didn't know that? But a lot of people don't know that. And so exactly. there is something to be said for art and humanities to bring these stories out so that Amen. we're not desensitized to, I want you to know a business professor said this, Dr. Meyer Harris. I, I'm <laughs> noticing that. <laughs> but you have to bring, we've got to get people to, to, to see, the, see black people as people, understand yes. some of this, and try to get, so I agree with what he just said, because it's become a sociocultural norm. Yes, yes, indeed. And we've got to find a way to, to get that message out. Yes. Uh, Attorney Johnson, did you want to add anything to that? Just to echo that, uh, essentially, I think what Dr. Hollingsworth is, is saying is that to the extent that we can meet people where they are with this information, we're all going to be better off. Yes. And so if, if, if that's through the arts, through the window of the art, like the Watchmen. So I, I'm, I'm into history, I'm into to history, not fiction. But, but I applaud what Watchmen did because it opened a window for a lot of people who then went out and found the history on their own. Exactly, exactly, for sure. Well, gentlemen, thank you. This has been, uh, I think, a, a robust and very informative conversation for our audience. There's so much of this history that most people do not know about. And so it really provides a context uh, and a knowledge base uh, for understanding what's going on in the world today in terms of African-American economic uh, empowerment and that quest, uh, and not just here this, in the United States, but across the, the, the world, the globe. Um, there, we know that there's a, a Black economic empowerment initiative that's been going on in South Africa um, over time. So um, this conversation has been, I think, fruitful, informative. Uh, and I'm gonna turn things over to Jennifer. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Harris. Thank you, Dr. Hollingsworth and Attorney Johnson. What a terrific conversation. There, there was a, a comment in the chat that I think really captured that, that, you know, thank you for the history lesson. I think there, there are others saying, these are things I didn't know and hadn't heard. Yes. And yes. the context is essential for us to not repeat these same uh, tropes into the future. So, um, you know, the historic barriers to opportunity for the Black community, the systems of opinion, action, inaction, um, the, the laws and policies that you all brought forth to provide us a deeper understanding, and also for the grounding in models of success for Black created business that, um, that, that, illustrate paths forward. And I think that's where we'll pick up the conversation next time is understanding solutions and actions as we push forward to end the practices of the past, to end the racism of the past, and set a new dynamic for civic engagement, for social engagement, for economic engagement of communities of color in our future moving forward. So thank you all very much. You can find our speaker bios, additional resources, and everything to register for the next in these amazing conversations uh, at pointsoflight.org. We thank you all so much. We wish you the happiest of holidays uh, in the coming week. And uh, thank you again for being with us today. Thanks everyone for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. This has been Jenny Lawson at Listen, Learn, Act, and Racism, a partnership between Points of Light and Morehouse College. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.